What's going on there, Workforce? Chris here with work to game and today we are going over part two of the 4.3 live letter. For any of you new here that haven't had a chance to join us over on stream or anything like that, I do want to let you know for the next several months there is a giant expansion going on on the house next door to me. So if you hear some weird noises in the background, that's what that is. So let's dive in. So the first thing is they had a ton of pictures this time. So I'm going to be putting a lot of those over here, and they're going to be just cycling through. We also got a fair amount of game footage. This is not shocking for part two, but it is always something to be excited about, especially on like these big content patches where we've got major things coming out. You know, if you think back to kind of 3.3 in that range, 4.3 is when we should expect a lot of updates to things like Deep Dungeon and, you know, how is the relic going to progress now that we're into a kind of a part two of it. And so, first of all, they confirmed everything that they said in part one, just in case anybody wasn't around for that. And they also showed a sweet trailer. So if you haven't had a chance to see that, it is in the link below. It went live this morning uh, during the live letter. And so that is definitely something very cool to watch. Very, very awesome. Uh, you should just, you should click on that. Now the date was confirmed for May 22nd. This is what we thought it would be going into part one. This is what we thought it would be coming out of part one. And so anybody who was kind of on the fence about what that day would be, by this point, this wasn't really a surprise. It's the Tuesday, seven to 10 days after part two. Uh, so that just really makes sense as today is May 11th. And that puts us about, you know, 10 days out. Now, this being a large patch, this is going to be a full 24-hour maintenance. Uh, so expect there to be hardware going down. It, you just prepare for the patch to not necessarily be live exactly when you want it to. So if you want to see any more details on that, we have plenty of videos here on the channel. Uh, definitely feel free to go give those a look. And we're going to dive into part two now uh, with that kind of basis. And there are going to be seven jobs adjusted. And that is Dark Knight, Monk, Ninja, Samurai, Black Mage, Scholar, and Astrologian. Uh, he is aware that people have been asking for Dark Knight. And he doesn't... It, it's not going to be a total redesign. He thinks that would take at least six months. So, you know, there's a very good chance this will kind of be Paladin's expansion, and then we can have a different tank kind of take over in 5.0. But there are going to be adjustments. There are going to be at least eight changes to Dark Knight. Uh, Plunge will be buffed and shorten animation. The theme for these adjustments seems to be increased mobility, dropping that reaction time, which I think is going to help them really push us in trial content. When you get locked into these things, it, you know, when you start to encourage black mages to slide cast, then you're you're not really leaving abilities for people to feel like they're playing the class to dodge. They're kind of just doing the best with what they got. Uh, monks are going to be aligned based on the adjustments that have, have been made to samurai and kind of the stat, you know, the current standing of samurai. Um, so it looks like it's going to be a lot of enmity adjustments. Samurai is going to just get a plain potency across the board increase. Uh, so that's things, combos, weapon skill, uh, five different actions are going to just straight up be buffed, and then they're also going to have enmity suppression to go with that. Black Mage, the teleports got buffed, so the animation speed increases when you jump to your ley lines, uh, and they they don't think that it, they didn't say there's going to be anything about potencies. Uh, so that is just going to be quality of life for Black Mage. And this is so that people can focus very specifically, they said, people can use manipulation more than instead of slide cast. That's, that was how that was translated. Uh, Scholar will have focus on usability adjustments. Astrologian will get damage cast speed increased. And so this is focused more on cast speed. Light speed MP reduction effect doubled. Uh, more details will be in the patch notes, as expected. Uh, they didn't really go over anything on Ninja. They're not going to do too many exact details. I'm sure they're still working through those, and, you know, they, they, have, that time. they have the time. It's no big deal. Uh, so expect that to be possibly updated when, you know, they come out with more official translations, hit the thread. So with that, let's move into the new Beast Tribes. Uh, they did a ridiculous demonstration, and they hugged all those Namatsus. And these are not purchasable. These are actually one from Crane Games in Japan. Uh, so it, this is going to be taking place in Azim Step. They ran around the new area, and we are going to have a new Aetherite stop. So you'll either be able to teleport there or fly there. 
And the interactions between NPCs in the Namazu is supposed to be rich in volume, rich in, in depth in story. And so, you know, they're hosting this like Eastern themed festival. And uh, I think we're going to get to kind of help with that. And that leads us into like a fantastic mount. Uh, it should have some kind of dark humor and there should be you know, plenty to do here as this is supposed to be that kind of Moogle Quest like leveling feature for your subclasses, your crafting and gathering from 60 to 70. So if you have any of those to 60 and you have not pushed them to 70 in Stormblood, you get this unlocked, you push through that. Uh, this should be really exciting. The mount is <laughs> so awesome. And uh, I think what was also crazy about the mount is like we were all, you know, sitting in chat wondering if it could fly and then they did they flew it right off the edge of the cliff and it looks even funnier when it's flying uh i would love to see this be a multi-person mount i don't think it's going to be but it looks like i could have other people standing on other sides uh but he said that if multiple multiple but he said that if multiple people are summoning this it is going to be very noisy because it supposedly makes a crazy noise and all that the background music is supposed to change while you're on this mount so it should have its own unique background music housing updates uh they did come out with new housing items a lot of these were based on kind of player feedback there was some picnic based stuff and so these were contest winners uh so they showed you know kind of what the concept art was and what the in-game item was and so those will be kind of rotating through over here and then they showed us our message book and our message book is supposed to be something that you can leave your own comments in your own message book so you can use it as kind of a diary of sorts or other people can comment it those can be liked you can't like your own uh, but when you like them they're scoring these points of some kind so it should just be kind of an interesting way to interact with housing I know they're constantly trying to find a way to push people back into those districts because if your districts anything like mine I go there and I am the only person in the whole district they're also going to be moving, increasing the number of aquariums and apartments. Looks like it's going to be like six for the small, eight for the medium, ten for the large. Uh, they can't be stacked. Then they went over a new item, which is going to be tied to Golden Saucer. You'll purchase this with MG MGP. So uh, they did say, save your MGP. They didn't give us very long warning. Uh, so you're only going to be able to get so much. But there is plenty of MGP to be had for anybody that wants to focus on it. And it's going to be like a little basketball game. You buy it with MGP. You can put it in your house. Looks awesome. Now we're talking about the weapons refrain. So we're getting into actual content here. And they did show us some of the fight here. And so it starts off with Garuda and there's going to be no rocks because they said, why would rocks reduce the damage? So we just removed them. That's not going to be a problem, right? And they do show you that this is going to be a pretty unforgiving fight in that like when they touch the edge of the boundary, you don't take damage, you just die. You're just gone. And so this looks like we could be say, seeing kind of a Garuda and then an Ifrit. And, and so we'll just kind of carry through a series of fights and they're going to be shortened versions. Uh, and that they said that because they're shortened, don't expect that to make them any easier. So it's probably going to be just the most punishing parts of like three fights back to back. Uh, I look forward to getting my hands on that. That should actually be something really new and different to kind of try. I don't know. If, if you've been spending all your time in Eureka, it'd be good to just get in there and do some of that content. And that's going to lead us into Heaven on High. They did say they love that name in English, actually more than whatever that translates to on the Japanese side of things. Now, as you'd expect, some of the parts are going to carry over from Palace of the Dead. So the a method of obtaining weapons is going to be the exact same. The difference is we're going to get 100 floors on launch and the first 30 are going to be about story and leveling. And from 31 on, it's going to be geared towards being kind of multi-person like your, your party content it's supposed to be much much harder it is going to start at level 61 and prior to getting into the 31 content everybody's going to have to have cleared the first 30 levels now we are going to have pomanders just like before but they're obviously going to make tweaks to a few that they feel that could be improved upon now they're removing three pomanders that were obtainable in palace of the dead to transform enemy NPCs, and in their place, three new ones will be added. That and that is right. Some of this these changes are going to actually roll backwards onto Palace of the Dead. Uh, the Pomander of Incapacity applies uh, innervation to all enemies on current floor. The Pomander of Concealment uh, players will be rendered invisible to enemies and traps, but that will end upon any action or receiving any damage from an enemy. And then Pomander Petrification. They are removing the Manticore, and so in its place, we're going to get this Petrification, and that's going to make all enemies on the whole floor die in one hit. So instead of one of you getting to just run around and destroy things, it's going to make it to where everybody gets to just go crazy. So I think that is kind of a good change. 
In Heaven on High, we're also going to be getting some allied NPCs. Uh, so we are going to get Komenu, uh, Inugami, and Senri, and these are going to increase damage dealt, uh, decrease damage taken, or restore health over time. Um, supposedly these are kind of based on the lords. Obviously you guys know I'm not the uh, the resident lore guy here on the channel, so hopefully these images get you guys excited about any tie-in that has. Now you can find Magicite and use that to summon primals, uh, very old school Final Fantasy classic summoning style, to wipe the floor. Uh, you cannot stack it, you can only have one in your inventory at a time, looks like it's going to be kind of those three original primals. and. They're adding those to silver boxes. This means even if you're at $99.99, you're going to want to keep opening those because that's going to give you a chance at finding that Magicite, uh, which I'm sure is very intentional. Now, certain floor effects present in Palace of the Dead will be removed and replaced by others from Heaven on High. Floor effect Sprint. Sprint will be applied to all players at all times. Floor effect Magicite prohibited uh, means the use of Magicite is prohibited by all players. Now the big question is what's the rewards? And the rewards are going to be that we can obtain weapons, uh, which can enhance gear within Heaven on High. We can exchange 10 points of strength for a unique token, exchange a given number of tokens for a weapon. As of patch 4.3, the Palace of the Dead will be updated to utilize this same system. Uh, minions, mounts, and other special items can be obtained through the exchange of uh, pot shards found in Heaven on High, as well as from pieces of the Accursed Horde. Now, in case you guys are not noticing the theme here, the big, like, yellow text, that's where it's going back and affecting old content. Uh, now, they are going to go into a demonstration at this point, and they did say that this is going to be tied behind main scenario. I don't think that's shocking. Uh, you will obviously have kind of had a chance to get into the new main scenario. Expect Ruby C to be nuts. Except, uh, expect Azim Step to be nuts. Uh, these are just things, when this content drops, it's going to push people back out into the world in those areas. Now, Yoshida had his debug option on, so he was one-shotting everything, and he kind of explained that. Don't expect the first levels to be that easy. And he was really just trying to show us that different floors have different layouts, including what looked like a layout where there's just a wide open floor. Uh, and so that, you know, he said, but beware of traps. So like, there's still kind of the same things going on. Now they gave us a couple of previews of what floors could look like. They said there's a little more hinting and stuff going on in the trailers. Now next they up talked about performances and this isn't really a part of the game that I personally engage in, but I tried to keep an eye on it so that if any of you are huge fans here, this looks like it's being expanded massively. Uh, so the keyboard is getting much larger. UI improvements. Looks like you could be a proper musician and enjoy this. They are adding uh, oboe, piccolo, clarinet, flute, pan flutes. Uh, they said there you know could be some others they also are changing some notes that they felt sounded terrible uh they're developing possibly grand piano steel guitar pizzicato and at the end they kind of showed that if you hold the note it just keeps going uh and then will eventually fade off and then they talked about an accessibility mode now games even including 14 catering to people that you know have color blindness and things like that is not a surprise but this was really neat in that it took place over the whole game and they showed it off a little and it really drastically could change the world uh, to where it looked really bizarre for me that doesn't have the colorblindness that the example was was out there to correct um, but hopefully this is just that much easier and that much more enjoyable for anybody that was always hoping a game would kind of cater to this now as we moved into pvp they talked about the feast 2018 getting a regional championship and so this is kind of, they have said over the past several patches that this is what they've been building towards, is moving towards a more official kind of esports tournament presence. And so they kind of went over the fact that there will be preliminaries and semifinals and that we can expect these to begin in July. Uh, they'll be selecting champions from each data center and then they'll be paying for those people to go and be a part of FanFest. So it'll be interesting to see at FanFest kind of what exactly that looks like. Are they going to have the regional champions move on to kind of a world championship? I don't know. Now, all of this is in addition to the information that's been trickling out on the 4.3 special website, link in the description below. And so we know things like that the side story quest tied to the Four Lords, and a little bit of an exp explanation on kind of what the custom deliveries is. Uh, she has said that at some point we'll be able to kind of dress her up, and so I don't know if that's like a dress up doll or we're literally able to change what the NPC is wearing, uh, and kind of how the dome and reconstruction is going to look. Duty Finder update, this is a big one. This is going to allow us to do uh, chocobo racing, and Lords of Verminion from the Duty Finder. 
Uh, that's something that I feel should have been done a long time ago, and I think will make it a lot easier to kind of just pass the time, break up maybe some questing you're doing, and just kind of toss yourself in queue for something from time to time. And so hopefully that'll make those things kind of better engaged with. At this point, they took a break, and we went into part two. Part two is always where they kind of do interviews, sometimes more social things. Sometimes it's, it's very focused on stuff that really... Uh, it's just a totally different side of the game. It's almost very social in nature, but this one was a little bit uh, more towards something that, you know, even me, the non-lore guy, got really excited to sit there and listen to. Now, their guest is Yatsumi Matsuno, and Yatsumi Matsuno, just in case you're not aware, because I was kind of like, this isn't a face I recognize from previous live letters. I'm sure he's been around, uh, but, it, you know, kind of looking at what his, you know, resume is, uh, the, the big thing you would know is that, first of all, he actually wrote the Return to Evil East scenario. So that's why he was here, is this was all very centered on Return to Evil East. And that co comes from the fact that this is all direct stuff port over from 12 on PS2. He wrote kind of, he was the producer on the original scenario plot, the original concept, original director, supervision. Uh, he was a producer on Final Fantasy's Tactics Advance and a director and writer on the original PlayStation Final Fantasy's Tactics. So he has been around here for a long time and was apparently at kind of a, you know, company party and they were out late and all that. And he's like, oh man, we should totally... We should totally bring this into 14. And so they talked about possibly having him come in and write for like an Omega and instead said, you know what, a 24-man raid is really more the direction that we want to bring you in on. So they stepped into Return to Evil East. They tried to skip the intro to keep us from having spoilers. And actually, you kind of see Yoshida's face at the time get a little bit surprised because he was worried that something may have spoiled it in his mind. There was a mini text box shown, but, you know, spoiler alert for those of us here in, in the western side of the world, we don't, uh, we don't read Japanese, so it didn't spoil anything for me. Um, but they turned the cameras away, and they were trying to not show uh, too much. They did show the first boss way off in the distance, um, so I'll have a screenshot of that and uh, they were wondering, you know, well, should we go forward? Should we show you the first boss? And so and so he really looked back at, at the comments on previous series and on previous kind of, ex you know, expansions content like Crystal Tower and said that some things have been too long winded. Other things have not been story enough. Uh, the Void Arc series when it was created was done purposefully compacted and so when Yatsuno received the order to do Return for Ivalice, uh he followed the instructions of Void Arc and tried to make it in a compacted way. That being said, um, he did want this to be as significant as a main storyline, a main story quest. He said that this is going to be kind of main story quest level. Not level like equal, it's not necessarily going to be tied directly into massively shaping all of MSQ, but uh, that the volume and the quality and the approach is going to mimic that. Um, so, so really what they were saying is they definitely want you to slow down here and you know look at all the different text and look at all the time they spent on this story. They even created some new kind of NBCs, you know, it sounds like, and so they kind of showed us some of that character creation. Looks exactly like a character creation we would go through uh, for the Al Ra here. And then we got directly into the QA. And so the first question was, uh, we want to know, so now we're going to get into the questions. And these are just rough translations, so st stay with me here. Uh, they wanted to know kind of what the, the behind-the-scenes development was for Return of Eve release, if you could summarize that in three to five minutes. And he got these questions the night before, and so he actually, you know, was able to make, like, a slideshow on that. And he basically said, you know, kind of here's the timeline of how that happened. Uh, in January, they discussed possible participation in 4.0, and uh, that at the New Year's party, when they were out hanging out, they said, well, what do you think? Could we bring in something from Tactics? Could we bring in something from 12? Uh, does it need to be an original uh, story? And they said, you know, Tactics kind of makes the most sense, but you can definitely tie into other things, was what they kind of said at the time. He wanted to write this for the series because of, like, a significance with the 25-year anniversary, and, uh, and so in the end, that's how they kind of went forward with this then in October they said that okay we've got the plot outline um, and so this is all 2016 so this is this is a ways back and the dungeon boss was made the same as the shadow of mock series and would be done in three installments starting with patch 4.1 one dungeon three mini bosses one boss per patch of the 12 bosses 
Uh, a certain number would be designed by Kiti Amamiya, and you're going to notice that a lot of this stuff is where they wrote out their timeline, and then they went back and almost redacted it. So there's all these X's and question marks everywhere. Now in December, uh, they announced at 2016 FanFest that there would be a collaboration here, and uh, Stormblood obviously launched in June of 2017. When 4.1 went live, the Return to Evil East story began in the royal city of Robinastre, Robin and in May, 4.3 is obviously going live. Now, this is where this is going to continue into the Ritorana Lighthouse, which is what we've just been told we're getting here on the, you know, the kind of the 22nd. And they have said that in 20X, which we know that it's it's going to be 2018 or 2019, if it's kind of, you know, if it rolls into that 4.5 and it rolls into early next year, um, that there will be a certain patch that goes live and the return to Evil East will conclude with a blank. So I know that's just a whole lot of nothing. But here's kind of the constraints. Here's what they said. It can't be totally separate. Uh, it needs to it needs to exist entirely within the story of 14, you know, in some way, which it's been doing. So he worked very closely with Oda-san to make sure that the lore and languages were in line. And uh, obviously that means that that has to go through that whole translation process that they talked about at PAX. He said the story must be compact and be down to three chapters. So Return to Ivalice, you know, they know that that can only be over three raids, which we expect that to be 4.1, 4.3, and 4.1. Point five, which would probably be early January. Uh, as text piled up, he said, wow, it's actually going to be very hard to make this compact. And so you start to see questions about like, well, when you bring characters over, are those the same characters? And no, they're not really. They're, you know, you may see the same name as something here, but it's, it's kind of totally separate characters being brought over. So it's more of a fan tribute than a real direct collaboration. They did have a chance to show off just a little bit of kind of the gear and they just had those kind of on printouts. And he was asked a lot about, okay, as, we, as we've as we been exposed to bosses over 4.1, as we get exposed to bosses over 4.3 and then 4.5, how do you decide who's in there? And as fans, can we kind of ask for those? And he said that those have all been kind of predetermined by the way the story plays out. And so Yatsumi got to choose those bosses personally based on his preference. And he kind of showed a little bit of like old binders from original Final Fantasy tactics where they were kind of pulling different ideas from and kind of talking about how to make sure that this was kind of inspired by but fit within 14. So it looked like an enormous amount of work, at least on the lore side, which makes sense because when he was later asked what his favorite part of 14 was outside of main story, since that's obviously a big piece of what he's now involved in, uh, he said, well, main story. And so, you know, he's kind of a story guy. For any of you taking note on the way this story is written and if it feels any different to you than maybe previous expansions and previous alliance uh, stories have, alliance raid kind of stories, uh, he, he is hugely influenced and referenced by Shakespeare when it comes to uh, literature and that there was no video games when he was a kid and so a lot of it is based on novel novels and theater literature. So he has said that the Return to Evil East is supposed to play out like a small play and that that's how he's written this. Now he was asked at this point, okay you're getting to be involved in game development, what would you tell Yoshi P that needs to still be changed? And he said that Eureka needs to improve um, and that he needs, he thinks that players need to be able to better track other party members as they get too far away, and this is something they've already said they're working on, and then he just wants to see overall quality of life improvements to the game. He just wants people to be able to get to the story, and just be able to get to what they enjoy. Um, and so Yoshida kind of said that he looked, uh, he felt a little pressured that he was looking at it from a player's point of view, but, uh, he would deal with it. Now, obviously, the speculation with him being involved in this is, is he working on another title at Square right now? Is there something else going on that he could be involved in? And so he said, you know, if given the chance, he would like to uh, like to write more scenario. Uh, Dom Alaska was, was something he talked about very specifically, uh, but he did not touch on whether or not he was working on any other titles at this time. Now, he did get asked if there was any food he'd like implemented into 14, and uh, he said something ethnic, something very ethnic, uh, something they can do for Thalvanian. And when asked what his biggest uh, motivation with all this Return to Evil East stuff has been, uh, outside of obviously helping with sales and the growth of the game, he said just the user's response, and that's both the good and the bad. Now, they did ask what is the dynamic between him and Yoshi P, like if Yoshi P kind of says, 
you know, does he, what, what happens when he gives you instructions? He's like, ah, I say no. He can ask somebody younger to do that instead of him. So he just kind of, they, they were playing at each other. Um, so it is interesting to think about the dynamic behind the guy that's that's kind of handling all of Ivalice as we know it, and then obviously Yoshi P and his role on the game. And that's something that we've been talking about over the last six months is how do we make the game move in a direction where Yoshi P could theoretically get to a point where he doesn't have to tell people what to do. Now the real reason that I stuck around all the way to the end here is these got more and more just kind of them talking and chatting and it moved into a whole joking session was because I was hoping for news on FanFest. And so to finish this out, I did want to say that that is what they finished with. Uh, we got some FanFest stuff. So um, we finally, we have confirmed dates for Europe and for Japan. Um, so obviously we know that, you know, kind of November 16th and 17th is when we're doing it here in the U S in Las Vegas, uh, at the Rio and February 2nd, they'll be doing it in Paris at the Le Grand and Feb and March 23rd and 24th, they'll be doing it in Tokyo, um, at the Makur Hari, uh, Messi Hall. I'm sorry if I butcher all these pronunciations. And they talked a little bit about what we can expect at E3 on Tuesday, June 12th. Um, so, you know, we can expect them to have a showcase there. We can expect them to be present. Obviously, we know Square is going to have a huge presence at E3 this year. We expect Kingdom Hearts and things like that to announce. Um, but this is where we're going to have the next live letter. Uh, Tuesday, June 12th at 11 a.m. PDT. And for those of you that are want to go see the Horizon uh, Symphony, that will be in L.A. on June 15th and Saturday, June 16th at the Dolby Theater. And then they went over the cosplay walk on June 16th there in Hollywood in front of the Dolby Theater and uh, how, you, you know, kind of when you can expect that and that you would have to have tickets to get inside. Now, they did go over the next Fate event, and that's going to be in Kyoto. And uh, there's no entry fee. It's just invitation only. And that that would be scheduled for Monday, July 16th. And uh, as we move on to the last few announcements here, Final Fantasy XIV will be playing Final Fantasy Tactics live on May 12th and May 19th. There will be a 4.3 live uh, note reading by Yoshida, and that will be broadcast uh, Monday, May 21st. Uh, this will only be in Japanese, so, you know, if you understand Japanese, that would be really cool to enjoy. And that the Primal's first album um, is ready to be released late May, and uh, they have some pricing, and that you can pre-order your copy today. Uh, this is also time for them to release the Final Fantasy XIV original soundtrack to Stormblood, and this will go on sale Wednesday, July 4th. Uh, this is a little bit pricier. So if you're into that, that is where that becomes available to you. And for those of you that have stuck around all the way to the end, that spoiler phrase was translated to why that monster Bakamonen awaits what? And so that is all we know about kind of the new content that they've been keeping massively under wraps. So this has just been a summary and kind of live translating for you guys. Obviously, uh, English kind of takes a little bit longer to trickle over in an official sense. And usually by that point, we're pretty much ready for the patch to go live. Uh, so I would love to know what you guys think in the comments below. What are you most excited about? In my opinion, what I wish they talked more about was how the crafting and gathering is going to work. That's supposed to have a bigger role in this patch cycle. And it felt kind of like it was just like, oh, yeah, that's a thing. Um, I, I think that it's a solid, well-rounded, odd-numbered patch. It has everything that we expect from an odd-numbered patch, and uh, I look forward to getting in and, and trying some of that out. I look forward to how much of it looks like it's going to trickle over the 4.3 series, so it looks like since, you know, the Eureka's not going live till 4.36, as this stuff kind of lays out, by the time you get bored of Eureka, we should only really be like a week or two out from 4.4 going live. Uh, so hopefully this is going to feel pretty action packed and keep us solidly busy during the summer. This has been Chris with work to game. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day and I will talk to you next time. I've been wading through any heavy sawing and hammering noises. If you wonder why there's been so many jump cuts.